missed my most important, I should record this talk. I'll start that over again for those of you watching the, this later on. So today we're talking about building great teams. And uh, come on in, Will, there's room. Um, and uh, my name is Hugh Gordon, and I've been on a lot of different teams over the years. Uh, different roles, web developer, CEO, manager, product owner. Uh, these days I do agency and community outreach at Hand uh, Hands down, if you're not familiar with it, we provide web development tools for teams and the best optimized uh, Drupal hosting on the planet. So if you're not familiar with us, we have a bunch of us here, we've got a booth downstairs, happy to talk about it. Um, and I'm Pete Gordon on Twitter. Uh, so let's get into what we're talking about today. So we're going to be doing, or the, the path that we're going to go down today and we'll talk about uh, are starting about looking at great teams and what great teams have in common and sort of some uh, aspects of great teams that we shall strive to uh, have in our, our teams that we, that we uh, whoo, okay. uh, the teams around us. Uh, and then great teams are successful teams. So great teams tend to grow. With success comes more work, more things, and you need no, more new people, more great people. And so looking at how you do that. Uh, what's the role of management in all of this? And then all of us aspire to be great ourselves. If you want to be on a great team, you better be a, a good member of that team. Uh, and then we'll have questions and conversation at the end. And uh, I'm hoping that what I'm talking about takes no more than 30 minutes. We'll see. That is my optimistic es uh, estimate at this point. Um, so hopefully we have time at the end for about 15 minutes of talking through some of these things. So great teams. Uh, what are some of the ingredi ingredients of great teams? Uh, you need a shared purpose. You need distributed power. You need diversity. You need good communication, and you need the right people in the right seats. And all of these are well studied and well understood, um, and they have a dramatic impact on the results of teams. So, shared purpose. If your team does not know why it exists, if you can't simply say, why does your team exist? What is it that you do better than anyone else? Uh, you're going to have a hard time being a great team. If you don't all know, if you're in an orchestra and you're not sure the music that you're playing, if you're on a team playing soccer, if you're not sure which direction the goal is, you're going to have a problem. Uh, you need to agree as a team on where you're going, why you're doing that, and how you're getting there. My team at Pantheon, well actually, before we do that, my team at Pantheon happens to uh, help make agencies more effective in what they do and use Pantheon's tools to do so. Straightforward. Let's look at some examples. So, if you look at Nike's example, this is a mission statement. You know, whether or not they do this all the time, who knows? But to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. This is what Nike says they do. And by the way, when they say athlete, they say, by that we mean if you have a body, you're an athlete. So if you contrast that to another significant company in the, in the uh, space, Adidas. This is what they say it is. The Adidas group strives to be the global leader in the sporting goods industry with brands built on a passion for sports and a sporting lifestyle. Those are two pretty different ways of talking about what you do. So if you think about this too, so we're looking at this one. Having issues with my phone here. Uh, so, uh, if you think about the Nike one, that was English, that was uh, short, it was comprehensible. It is, all right, pardon me. Um, no, not at this point. Okay. So, if you look at the Nike, the, what, what Nike says it does, this is short, this is actionable. Um, how many of you think people working at Nike are more readily able to execute their plan than people working at Adidas? Right? Like, I'm just curious. So, hands. How many like resonates with them personally? The Nike version versus the Adidas version. For the record, that's pretty much everybody willing to raise a hand. It seems. Anybody disagree? Actually, no. Um, if you can say, as a team, as a group what you do and why you do it, you can tell yourselves that, the more uh, likely it is that your people will be able to act on this vision, 
the, uh, this vision that you have. Great teams also distribute power. So command and control is like the typical way that we see organizations drive org charts, for example. Like you have a CEO at the top, and then there's like a tree down below, and a lot of more people in the to them and such. And that is a, that's sort of like a leftover of a very different era in the world. So it came out of World War II, the Industrial Revolution, where there was a central controlling sort of authority that needed to say, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. That's effective in some situations. In organizations that are all about services, creativity, problem solving, it's not effective. It is not the right mental model to have. And odds are, if you're in this room, you're at a Drupal camp, you're probably involved in delivering services to clients and solving problems along the way, for example. It's not a good mental model for us. People need power to solve their own problems. So you need to give it to them. The role of management is to support the people doing the work, clear the roadblocks, um, and make sure that you know what they're doing and get the garbage out of the way for them. This is a good article. These slides, by the way, will be um, up on the node on the page for the uh, uh, for this presentation after I talk. But this particular article talks it does like a nice summary of this idea of reversing the hierarchy. What you're supposed to do as a management uh, for a management team: distribute the power. Great teams are also diverse, and diversity is their. There are a lot of studies at this point in time uh, that talk about this, like diversity of gender, race, religion, languages spoken, background, even things as shallow, perhaps, as politics uh, can be actually effective as diversity tools in terms of their effectiveness of a group. So there, this again, there's a good article here about this. One of my favorite studies or, or points here is uh, in 2012, Credit Suisse, which is like a huge multinational bank with about $900 billion under management when they did this uh, study, they studied about 2,400 different companies and said, all right, what makes a company more likely to be uh, successful and profitable? And they found that one of the indicators was, is there a female member of the board? Just that simple. And they found that having at least one female board member yielded a higher return on equity and a higher net income growth than those that did not have a woman on the board. That's just having a single person on the board. And now this is Credit Suisse. This is not like these people wear suits every day, they manage 900 billions worth of, you know, they may, there may be people at Credit Suisse who believe in gender equality and you know, opportunities for all and other things like that. But their job is reliant on them producing better results for their investors. If they don't do that, they go out of business. They're very much bottom line motivated. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. And what happens with diversity, actually, there's two pieces. One is uh, there's someone else in the room who has a different opinion. You get more sources of information. You get more uh, viewpoints, perspectives. That's like the one. I think we probably all know about that. But another factor of diversity, again, also well studied, demonstrated, proven, is that it does something to us internally. When we know that we're presenting to a diverse group, talking, bringing an idea, sharing a thought, some, anything that you're doing that has a diverse group with you, you do your work better. Because you realize, I'm going to be talking to someone else, explaining my ideas, arguing for a position, and not everyone there is going to think just like me. And it causes you to check yourself and say, like, well, I'm going to see this. Is that really true? Is this really how things work? And you do more work yourself by simply having other people present who have a different background. And again, it can go as shallow as politics. This has been studied with Republicans being told that they're presenting to Democrats on something. Or uh, you know, in my own workplace, we have a little bit of WordPress and Drupal diversity, which is a curious kind of diversity, but it works. It makes us think a little bit harder, work a little harder, and that produces better results. For those of you who actually are interested in this topic, I know there's a talk next somewhere here on uh, diversity. I'm not sure what room it's in. Next door. Next door. Thank you.
Good teams communicate well. So just like the org chart is a problem in management, sort of like that structural, that's the way communication runs in your organization, uh, that's a problem. Great communication groups, when you, when you map out the communication grids of effective companies, you see a web, a lot like the web, like the thing that we work on. Uh, and I think if you think about like the way websites work, for example, we see this in our own daily work, actually. Uh, effective web navigation is often cross-linking. It's not go to the top menu. That was the only way to move around a website. It's really inefficient. People are less engaged, etc. There's a reason Amazon invented the you might also like. It's because it's effective. You're cross-linking between people and things. Um, make sure that your organization is facilitating these sort of interdepartmental, interdisciplinary con uh, conversations among the people that are doing the work. If you have meetings in your team setting that uh, are like status meetings, where I sit down and I say, Blah 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 for five minutes. Blah 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 blah. And an hour later, everyone's heard blah blah blah. Does that sound familiar to anybody? There's some some laughs there. Yeah. Those are terrible meetings. What are they for? What is that accomplishing? Who cares? Like, what's the? Uh, are we all just telling the person that we report to something? What's the What's the point? Then write it down. Don't waste everybody's time to do that. It's terrible. Uh, and make sure that. Others, if you're in the case of management, right, let the people doing the work set the agendas. What is it that we need to talk about? And let them lead what needs to be discussed. Far more effective. The last character, uh, characteristic of great teams I want to talk about is having the right people in the right seats. So this comes by the way of um, Jim Collins, who's a uh, good to great, is one of the books, but sort of management consultant kind of person. Uh, we all come to the world. We have skills, we grow more of them. Different roles require different skills. Um, and if someone is failing what they're doing, they know it. And probably everybody around them knows it too. Uh, if you have someone in the wrong seat, the, the metaphor is of a bus, right? We're all getting on the bus, we've got a right person the driver, other person, you know, different roles and such. Um, if you have someone that doesn't, is not able to do the role that's required of them, you need to Switch the seat or switch the person, right? They need to find something else or you need to let the person go. Say, um, and those things are always hard. And hard things, you, like, it's easy to wait on hard things and not tackle them right away because they're hard. But uh, we'll get to it in a little bit. Like, that's the job of someone who's a manager in a team that wants to have a great team. You must address these things and you must do that quickly and, and with compassion. Uh, but don't let things, don't let bad things linger. And if that bad thing is a person who doesn't know what they're doing and isn't able to execute on the role, work with them to figure out what they could do better, figure out what that is, help them get there. Might be within the organization, might be somewhere else. So, great teams have shared purpose, distributed power, diversity, good communication, and the right people in the right seats. If you have all of those things, uh, the research says you will be successful. You will be producing, you will be, whatever it is that you do, you'll be doing it very well, you will have more work, you will have lots of things going on, and eventually you're going to say, ah, we need more people to do the things. So let's talk about people. So finding the right people. Uh, there are some factors, some, 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 some steps. So what are the seats? What are your values? Any of you with those things in mind? And understand motivation to do this as well. What people are looking for. So, when it comes time to sit, like you, you say, like we're, we're, we're working really hard, a lot of stuff going on here, we need more people. Um, ask, I would four questions. Is there anything you're doing right now that you really can let go? Do you have to do all of the things? Is there anything that's obviously missing from what we're doing? Uh, and then, as individuals, ask, all right, are there things that I'm doing that I don't like doing as much as possible? And, frankly, that would be more of these other things. Ask those of the people around you, on the team, and you might be surprised at the results. This is something I personally stumbled into many years ago as I was growing a team. 
that you know, is doing web development for folks. <coughs> we were busy, we thought we need more people, like do we need another developer, do we need another designer? We're, and uh, we sat down and we did this, and we wrote down the things that we thought we weren't doing really well, and the things that we thought we could maybe hand off to someone else, because weren't our favorite things. And we put those together, and we realized that what we had just described was actually a pretty cool job for someone who liked project management. Like, that's the thing. Like, that was the gap. And this exercise really helped us identify, ah, I think this is the thing you call project management. And we discovered that, and it was very good. So, once you know what the seed is, make sure you're clear on your own values. So, and by value, I mean things like teamwork, or passion, making, you know, like care about your work, customer service, other things like that. Does anybody here have actually values that they could guess or like state, like one or two values? There's a head down there. Anybody want to volunteer? We have one that is give a shit. You have to give a shit. And oh, right. one, another one is make progress every day. Cool, right. So these are two different kinds of things. Anybody else have other ones to throw out there? Okay. Um, so once you know what those things are, so say it's customer service, uh, you need to start interviewing people with these things in mind. And you use the skills, the, the seat vacancy, as well as looking at it through the lens of your values to find the right person. When you're interviewing people, this is another place actually that unconscious biases, uh, you know, we all have them, they creep in. If you follow a structured process to interview people, it helps you really, again, surface the best folks. Uh, four different kinds of questions that I recommend. And this comes, again, by way of management consultants. Uh, I didn't make this up. Um, asking factual questions. Are, do you have a master's degree? Do you have a computer science degree? Um, do you know something? Like, just factual check the boxes kinds of questions. Those are important. You need to have some basic qualifications for, for every role. Um, skill assessment. Ask someone how they do something. All right. Yeah, so you're hiring a project manager. Show me how you manage projects now. Like, what's your project flow? That person better be able to diagram something that you can understand, even if you don't know what you mean. They're coming from a different industry. Uh, but you should be able to understand what they're doing. And then behavioral and situational are really important. And it's important to understand the difference between them. Uh, because behavioral looks past. You say, tell me about a time where you dealt with an unhappy client. Tell me about a time when you were developing for a third party system and the API documentation was incorrect. What did you do? Like, ask those questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's always incorrect. Trick question. Um, that's past looking. And it's important. But one of the things that, um, that we always need to be uh, mindful of as you're adding to a team uh, is the capacity of the people to grow. So getting them situational questions. What would you do if those kinds of questions really can open your eyes to the possibilities that this person will have to grow and be great in your organization and with your team? Asking all four of those kinds of questions is a really, like, again, do all of them and, and, and score in a matrix if you can. Look at your values, listen to the keywords. If it's give a shit, if it's, um, again, customer service, whatever it is, Listen to all of their answers, and are they talking like that? If so, they'll fit in. They'll, they're an instant player on this great team. If not, probably not. And the last thing about finding the right people is that you need to understand motivation. So Daniel Pink has a book called Drop, and he's also got like a TED Talk, which is uh, which is pretty neat. It's a short, you know, you get a lot of the ideas in like 15 minutes. Uh, I recommend it. I think it's in the speaker notes. Uh, so if not, I'll put it in there. Um, but he describes, so he's done a lot of research on motivation. What is it that motivates people? And uh, describes an experiment in which people are basically have to solve a problem that's not totally obvious. Like, how do you do this thing? You, hear, you know, there's a, there's a solution at the end. It involves configuring some stuff in a you know, physical way and sticking things around in different places, and it works. Um, you do, you have 100 people do this, 
Turns out it takes four minutes, 38 seconds, or something like that. Now you do it another 100 people, and you say, hey, uh, I'm timing you. We want to see how long it takes for these things, how long it takes to do this. And then you tell another different 100 people, we're timing you. And if you are the fastest person, you're going to get $20. If you're the top 20%, you're going to get $5. Anybody want to guess? Like, how much faster was the, was the group that was getting money for this? Anybody want to venture a, a guess? They were slower. They were slower, which is weird. That's not supposed to happen. Wait, capitalism, what? But it has been reproduced many, many, many times over. And then like in different situations, like, well, maybe 20 bucks isn't enough. Like, eh, people are not motivated by that. So take it to a third world country where, you know, uh, Research scientists at universities don't tend to have large budgets. But if we offer 20 or $100 in that situation, maybe that's like a week's worth of wages. There could be situations where that's a lot. Same results. This is really jarring, right? We've been taught that pain, benefits, and those kinds of things. Like, if you do this, then you get this. Those rewards work. They don't, again, in situations, they work in some situations. They don't work when it involves creatively, uh, creatively solving problems, uh, things that are not immediately clear, things that aren't just like, put this widget right here. If it's, if it's a task that says like, you have to put 10 widgets in a row, line them up just perfect, here's the thing, do that. It does actually work in those situations. But for problems like we solve, which is like helping, you know, what is your problem? How can I help solve it? How can I build a site? Doesn't work. Instead, uh, he articulates three, three things that, in fact, people do want. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. These are the things that we all want. Maybe you think about your own self, right? Um, you would like to have the autonomy to do what you think is right. Do what You understand the role, you understand the job, you understand the team. You want to have the chance to do the things. Mastery is the chance to get better at something, to really progress and do something very, very well. And then combine that with purpose. I want to make sure that my work is contributing to something larger that I know about and can believe in. Those three things are what motivate people. And it's, again, super effective and really relates to the management structures and such I, I, I talked about as well. Um, again, his name is Daniel Pink. It's a, it's a fantastic TED Talk if you're interested in checking it out. So for those of you involved in management, we have some responsibilities. You need to find the thorny issues. You have to seek out the hard problems. You need to get out of the middle. You need to praise and blame and understand the different places and, and times for that. You have to strive to be a better person. And you need to understand the role of policies versus conversations. So the thorny issues. Uh, again, it's human nature to hide from the hard stuff. If you are a manager, you must not do that. You are, in fact, failing. That is your responsibility. You need to handle the yucky stuff that nobody else has, wants to do. That's what's expected of you. If you don't want to do that, it's okay. Don't be a manager. You also need to get out of the middle, right? The more things that run through a manager, the more that hurts everyone else. The more that person becomes a bottleneck, the less autonomy everyone else has, the less motivated they feel, the less happy they feel. As a manager, what you need to do is make your team effective and clear roadblocks. I'm having trouble with this particular client. I'm having trouble with some hardware stuff here. Okay, how can your job, if you hear something like that from a team member, this is, all right, that's a cry for help. What can I do to help make that problem go away? Don't be a bottom line. When things are going well with your manager, that needs to belong to your team, right? They're the people doing work. If things are doing poorly, that is on you. You have not set the situation well enough for the people to succeed. You need to own that. When you have an opportunity to praise, do that 
in a way that everyone could feel proud of, praise him publicly. If someone is not doing well, generally, well, there may be exceptions to this, you need to address that privately with them. When you're a manager, you need to strive to be a better person. You need to model the behavior. If you, like, I'm a parent as well, so like, don't do what I say, do what I tell you. Like, I have said these words, and you know, said them self-aware. Um, uh, we, we joke about many things in my house because they're older now. Uh, but the same thing is true. Like, model the behaviors you want. If you can't do what you're asking others to do, it's a problem. Uh, you either need to realize that what you're asking others to do is too much or too hard, or uh, you need to understand that maybe you're not cut off for this. People's eyes are on you. Like, you need to live up to that. The last thing about when we're talking about management is um, policies. How many people have a, a, a policy manual about for their work? Some of sort of like the, the policies that we have are written down. Got a couple head nods. Um, has anyone ever seen, either in the current organization or previous organization, an issue being addressed by a new paragraph being added to the company policy manual about some very specific thing, like, wow, that seems like you don't want so-and-so doing that thing. And it's very particular, and that's the way, like, that is a very weird, roundabout, ineffective way to deal with something that might be a problem. Now, you can write things down in the company policy handbook, but it shouldn't be uh, before you talk to that person. You can say, look, there's an issue. This is why we think this is a problem. Discuss. And then, just so you know, the policies are changing. We're doing that. We want to make sure everybody's clear on this. Uh, passively, aggressively writing something down and then saying, oh, you're no longer compliance is really weak. People problems need to be dealt with by people, by conversations. And that means you, if you're a manager. Last of all, all of us, we all have a real, you know, like we all want to be on a great team. So we all have a part, manager, not, right? So uh, three things all of us need to do in order to be on a great team. Use a growth mindset, pay attention to your language, and uh, be the change you want, right? So, uh, uh, by growth mindset, I mean, and again, this is actually another term. Um, I have a bibliography with some books that I think are useful and helpful. Um, there's a, a researcher, I think she might be based in Harvard or something like that, but this is her terminology. Uh, the idea is that we're all growing. None of us is done. We're not like, you know, I'm not the last Drew that will ever exist, right? I'm, you know, like, I, there will be more me, I will change over time, I will grow over time. Um, if, when you say things like, I'm not a math person, or I don't do that, those kind of negative, if you define yourself negatively by what you don't do or don't like or don't, you're limiting yourself in ways that's not fair to you, not fair to the people around you. Um, and her work really focused in on this, is like, if you wanna change something, you start with a small habit, don't say, uh, for example, I would like to lose some weight. Uh, that's the, I have a number. I want to hit it. It's great. Um, if I focus on that number instead of making small little changes, it will be very difficult for me to achieve that goal. I can, I can instead say, I'm not going to have a snack after dinner. Like That's an effective way to actually achieve a goal and have a growth mindset in what I'm doing. Uh, rather than saying, I have or I am not where I should be right now. I'm not a math person, I'm not the weight, whatever it is. Um, and anyways, that's having a growth mindset and being aware of the potential that's inside of all of us and using that and talking about that too. Right? Language really matters. Language, action, and thought are all really closely related. And language, if you want to change behaviors, or you want to improve at something, you want to get something else going on in the, in the world, Starting to talk about it differently is actually 
like e extremely critical. And it's actually the easiest place to start, and some ways the hardest place to start. But once you start talking about it differently, you'll start acting differently, you'll start thinking differently. And this one, I cringed a little bit when I wrote this down because it seems really cheesy. Uh, I said this out loud to a coworker sometime in the last week or two and I cringed a little bit at that point in time. Um, internally, probably. I hope they didn't actually see me cringe. But uh, it's just so, I don't know, the cringing is because I feel it's very candid. But I think it's really real, too. Um, if you don't like a pattern, change it, right? What am I doing, like, rather than complaining about, like, Ugh, I wish we didn't do things like this. I wish it wasn't like that. Just start changing what you're doing that might be enabling that. And if people notice, let them know why. It's easy. You can start small. All right. So, great teams have great characteristics. Um, they need great people. There are ways to find them. You need great management. And then be great yourself. That is what I want to talk about. And actually, I'm actually very pleased at the half an hour. So uh, briefly, I would really appreciate it if folks would give me feedback. Uh, it's really helpful for myself and the organizers to know about these things. But I will pause. Questions, conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, uh, with, with the management about uh, uh, not being a roadblock, mm -hmm. uh, not being a bottleneck, um, that, that having that having to do with communication. So, what are some of the fundamentals of good team communication? So, when people map again, like. Uh, there are a lot of ways maybe to answer this, but I'm, I'm thinking academically. So when you map you know, an organization that works really well, you know, people who do this, they, they go they go to an organization and say, like, there's a, there's a, there's a um, you know, I want to see how communication works in this organization. Like, you're, you're meeting with that person, you're meeting with this, this person, they'll, they'll graph it out. Um, the graphs of companies that work really well, that solve creative problems, do the kinds of things that we do, um, have a lot of, it, it looks messy. It's a lot of like, there are a lot of you know, like individual per people connecting and it's just like a, it looks like a picture of the World Wide Web, which I haven't seen one of those in a while. But it's like, it's a messy little nest, like people all over the place. And um, correspondingly, if you look at things, the organizations that are failing, those look like a lot of hubs and spokes uh, in a different way. Like a manager talks to you. I now talk to you. I now talk to you and I'm communicating these things. And these connections aren't happening. And in fact, like those, those spokes are managers, when in fact, or, or like, like the hubs, sorry, the spokes are, are managers, when, uh, again, like these highly effective ones, there's just ad hoc conversations happening. When you, when you feel like, oh, I have a problem, I need to solve it. I think that somebody over on the other side of the team does those kinds of things. And it's natural for them to go over and talk to that person. and not, I'm going to fill out a report and hand it up the chain and we'll make it the vice president of something. Maybe three months later, it won't make it across to the next one. You mentioned doing that exercise of figuring out like what the values are, figure out what the seed is that you need to fill. How often do you guys go through that process? Versus yeah, I'm gonna extend that versus like just saying, all right, like we generally want to expand with this type of person, mm -hmm. and we'll throw up a general. Right. I mean, there's certainly times when I, um, the exercise I described was perhaps more for when you're not sure, like it's not clear, like we're busy, but what, what next? Versus, um, say, if you're working for a web development shop and you have two independent teams, say, as a theoretical thing, and you realize that you have enough work to have another third theoretical team. You can probably copy that over. All right, well, in our structure, it works well to have one. That's one project manager, two project developers, one of this, one of that, three other things. 
There we go. That's all. Thank you. Um, the more unknown, the more unsure you are about um, the, you know, like what position needs to be filled, the more helpful that is. But even if it's not, uh, doing something like that, I would say on an annual basis, is probably a really good idea. Um, I don't know that I've always done that in teams I've been on, but I hope I have. Um, we, in my most recent, like, so there are a couple people, interestingly enough, I can maybe close my ears and maybe some people on my team can, can answer some questions. Uh, we did an exercise like that um, earlier this year as we were thinking about, <coughs> we're busy, but we do. Working from your description of the communicating organization. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so you say that uh, communications tools like Slack have helped that happen. And then I had a second question. Um, how do you feel on telecommuting and virtual offices and environments? And is that leading to productivity, or do you have any research on that? Yeah, so uh, the question was about Slack and its role in sort of uh, creating, allowing, um, enabling ad hoc conversations. Um, I don't know of any research specifically that says that Slack or Slack-like programs, like chat of whatever sort, um, are a productivity indicator. but um, I have to believe, at least in terms of the communication, that they are. Because I just think about the way I use Slack, certainly. And it becomes very easy to like reach out and talk to you about this thing. Uh, uh, you, it's, it's probably more cultural, though. I mean, like, technology is never a... Uh, technology in and of itself never solves a problem. It might help solve a problem. But if you have a cultural sort of like, you don't talk to that person without talking to your manager first and other things like that, Slack isn't going to fix that. Um, However, if you've got a, you, if you have a culture that is receptive to like communication uh, amongst teams, then Slack's a great tool. You know, right now, we're going to talk. Uh, and the second part of the question was, oh, telecommuting. So um, I telecommute uh, probably about 50% of the time, um, or maybe more, depending <laughs> if I'm on the road or whatnot. Um, and I think, again, that, that's cultural. Some organizations do it really well. I know that there's actually some people here who work for virtual only organizations. And I know that there are some of those in this space that, that do that really, really well. Um, I know that there are other organizations who have you know, a hybrid. I, you know, I work for Pantheon, we do as well. Uh, we have a chunk of us in the San Francisco office, there's a chunk of us in Minneapolis, there's a few people in New York City. Um, we're you know, probably 70% in an office, 30% elsewhere. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job of making sure that those of us who work remotely are you know, full human beings, but we're not totally there, I don't think. Um, so again, I, I think it's more about culture. I, I know organizations that do much worse that have tried working from home kinds of situations, telecommuting, working remotely, and just failed. Like they, whatever reason, their culture, their values just didn't allow it. They just couldn't make that leap. Um, so again, I think that, that it's maybe a tool, um, and if there's a problem with it, it's maybe cultural. To be the way I'd answer that. I was. I'd like to uh, just offer some elaboration on those answers. Like I, I had mentioned that one of our monitors is English, so I come from an organization where we also do like a hybrid type thing, part remote, part in office, and it's all that we do. I think we pull off the really messy structure pretty well. Everyone just talks to everyone, whatever. A nice tool we use that is a Slack plugin is called Hero Status. I don't know if anyone's aware of this. You basically just Every day, write a sentence about what you did yesterday, if you feel you achieved your goals or not, what you intend to do today, and there's an additional optional section where you can list blockers. Or if someone else on the team, if you're waiting on them, or if you have personal issues that are blocking you, and it's just very quick, very simple, and then it just goes up in a notification channel. And uh, we found that really useful for just like general, and, it, and it's something for yourself as well too. You you see what what you said yesterday you thought you would accomplish yeah, yeah. David actually has a talk on this I, sh I should have plugged this as well like in you know be great yourself David has a talk right after this in this room I think as well talking about personal productivity and those kinds of things I don't know if you're, you, perhaps even that specifically because we have a, a small like a discipline like that I bet they'll be talking about it Again, yeah, totally agree. And that's what we mind too. That was our the give a shit mantra. It's like the people that are just there for the paycheck, they're not going to do as good work when you are just a 
do as you please type organization, but the people who really feel that their lives benefit from do as you please, they work hard because they want to work yeah. hard. Yeah. You have a question for? Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if you found ways, especially like, I guess the way I view Pantheon is that for a while, I don't, I don't know about so much recently, but I know you guys are really fast growing hmm. for a long period yeah. of your, your culture and your organization, but encouraging uh, autonomy across newer mm -hmm. hires during periods of like right. fast growth. Like, um, I find that you can't order people to be autonomous, I guess. And Correct. So, <laughs> yeah, I would say, so, um, yeah, and I, I've looked through some of this. It's interesting that I, I, for many years, ran my own firm, and we were small uh, in terms of headcount, very deliberately. It was a very deliberate choice that we would stay at a certain size. Uh, and I joined Pantheon. Uh, we were 50, 60 people or so when I joined, and we're 110, 120-ish now, something like that. Uh, and that's over the course of about a year and a half, two years. So, yes, there's been a lot of growth. Um, and you certainly see that. I would say that's, uh, that's almost like a filter, like values. I'm, I'm not sure it is exactly a value, that autonomy, um, but if you know that you're going through that, it has to be like a filter. You look at those answers when you're interviewing someone to see if they're going to be a fit. You look for how they're describing what they've done in the past and how they would respond in the future. Uh, and no, again, we're headed towards rapid growth. We're in rapid growth. We need autonomous thinkers. So would you say, because I know it's reference on your motivation cool. slide, would you say it's a motivator for all? Yes, very, it is a, uh, yeah, so again, Daniel, um, Pink, where did it go? There we are, yeah. Yes, it is. This, these, these, and think about yourself, like, what do you want to do, right? If you had the chance to do good work, get better at it, and have that contribute to the greater good without someone poking you to do it like this, wouldn't that be a good situation? Uh, that's effectively his, you know, his reproducible study findings are, yes, in fact, we do want this. Um, would you say that autonomy is relative to the person? Like, some people want to have certain constraints in which they work, they wouldn't necessarily right. always want to run the whole organization, but there's there's Correct. A certain, have you found a good balance of knowing how to provide enough boundary but also autonomy based on the person? Absolutely. And that goes to the having a purpose, a shared purpose that you all know what you're going towards and why you're doing it. Um, if you have that shared purpose, that, that kind of sorts itself. Um, uh, people will group as teams. Not everybody wants to be in charge of everything. I mean, not everybody, yeah, like, no one can be. You know, like, there are different, there's actually one person whose job is to be in charge of everything. Their job sucks. CEO likes the worst job ever. Uh, uh, or it should be, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I think having, again, that shared purpose helps a lot. Uh, and, and again, like, values how you do it as well. So when you're talking about a shared purpose, yeah. is that, like, is that for you and your teams? And this might be, this yeah. might be bigger um, Do you think of that as like a team-wide shared purpose? Or do you think of it as like a company-wide shared purpose? Or yeah. are there both or neither? Yeah. You ever have any of those moments in life where you're like, why? I don't know. When I was in this section of the presentation, I was just not feeling myself presenting quite yet. So I kind of flubbed that. I was hoping to talk about that more here. So uh, this is, uh, thank you. Uh, so this is Nike's mission statement. And I don't know what Nike's culture is like as a whole, um, and whether or not they're actually you know, a great place to work and kind of know what you're doing and why. Um, but they certainly look like they're doing a better job. Than so that's an, uh, that's an example of like an organization level thing. Um, but there's uh, another really good book called Tribal Leadership um, that talks about this is that groups, so birds flock, um, fish, what do fish do? School. Yeah, okay, right. That's like, wait, better know what the answer is. Um, humans tribe is the, the, the premise of this book. And tribes are groups of 20 uh, to 100 people. I, I might have those numbers a little off, but approximately that. Um, and a larger organization is a tribe of tribes. Um, and so you need a, a tribal level. You should have a tribal level goal, uh, purpose as well. Okay. Yeah. 
So, <coughs> uh, as a manager, mm -hmm. unless you're the CEO or uh, owner of mm -hmm. the company, mm -hmm. you probably also have a manager. Can you speak a little bit about kind of the opposite oh. side, like not just dealing with as a manager who's your team, but how right. are you dealing with your management? Yeah. You? So, David happens to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> he happens to be on my team. Theoretically, an org chart. If you look at the traditional org chart, yeah, I would be. No, I am your manager. Um, yes, but I also myself have a manager. Um, and so, what is it that uh, someone in my position needs to do to communicate with my managers and others in the company? Um, and uh, largely, what I need to do is figure out what it is that we do when we're being effective, and communicate that clearly to the other leaders around, the other managers around, not everybody plays a manager, leader, and vice versa, but you know, communicate that with the other managers and make sure that we're all pulling in the same direction and we know why we're doing things and we are accurately saying, what, we're doing this, and you understand what it means and the nuances of it and help use that to say like, ah, we can all get to where we're going faster if we get behind this particular effort because we know what's actually happening. So it is my job to understand what it is that we do when we're being effective and to clearly communicate that so that we can make the right policies and have that be the way we do things. How do you handle when a team is, when you come across a problem that's involving the entire team? So it's like a disagreement that both sides have on the team? Is that just an individual problem? So, um, without getting you in trouble for your workplace, can you be a little bit more, um, like a for instance? like. No, no, so I'm a I'm I'm a student. So okay, like, yeah. like in my project group, we decide like if both sides of the group are deciding like we don't want to go with this path, we want to go with this path. Mm -hmm. and our team is vice versa. Mm -hmm. Our um, we decide that we just roll a dice and we just agree upon that. Sure. All right. So how would what would you like? Do you go compromise? Do you so that or I would actually say like the way you said that. I was talking about language. The way you said that is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like both sides of the team, and you were like using like like divided kind of uh, body language there too. Like there were two sides of the team. We disagreed about which way we're gonna go uh, and started heading in different areas. Like if you're in a situation where you can just roll the dice off the high stakes and do it, fine. Um, but uh, more often than not, life is not black and white. And what you really ought to do, in my opinion, is spend the time to understand why the other team wants to do that, the other group of people. And you probably will find nuances. It's not going to be black and white. It's going to be a whole you know, kaleidoscope of colors. And some of the reasons you're going to agree with, and some of them you're not going to think. And you have to, if you can have that dialogue, um, you should have the opportunity and the ability to <coughs> work together. Now, that's a, in the context of a workplace setting, we should have a common purpose, which is our you know, people agree on. Um, if you have a purpose problem, that's uh, that's bigger. That's like an issue for like, hey, all right, you got the wrong person uh, headed in the wrong direction on this team. You need to address that. Uh, but yeah, within a workplace setting, I would say where you have a c agreed upon purpose, understanding each other's motivations and what it is that, that is driving each of you to different directions, uh, is critical to figuring out the best path. And that's actually a little bit of the diversity. Um, that's like the diversity problem in some ways. This is what the opportunity of talking with different groups of people brings in that you do your research harder. You think, you check yourself. Like, is it actually true? Is this what we should be doing? Um, and taking the time to try and dialogue and understand someone else really helps get better solutions. De demonstrably, like not in a wishy-washy, we should, you know, like economically. Good. I believe we are over time. So I'm happy to keep talking. I'm around. Thank you.